It is an understatement to say that for Christians, there is a tension between complacency and courage in our interactions with governing authorities. When it comes to the government, do we go along to get along or confront and replace? Today on Groundwork, we delve into the complexities of Christian engagement and societal issues. Discover practical insights and biblical wisdom that empower you to stand for righteousness while navigating the intricacies of governmental authority. Join us as we invite you to actively engage and embrace your role in shaping a more just and God-honoring society next on Groundwork. Welcome to Groundwork, where we dig into Scripture to lay the foundation for our lives. I'm Scott Jose. And I'm Daryl Delaney. And Scott, we are in episode two of our three-part series on Christians in society, where we delve into some complexities of faith in a world with diverse cultures, ideologies, and authorities. And in the first episode, we talked about how to disagree without being disagreeable, and how do you handle conflicts when people slander and when people talk against you, and how do you respond And this episode today, we're going to talk about how to engage government authority. This whole series is about trying to figure out how to be a Christian, how to be Christ-like. In fact, the main theme of the third program in this series, the next one after this program, will be Christ-likeness and the need to try to be Christ-like in all areas, and particularly uh, in this one now, just over against the wider society in general. How do we view culture? We're going to talk about that here, but then also as part of that culture, how do we regard the governing authorities? What is the church's relationship, the individual believer's relationship to the powers that be? But to get us going on the culture question first, Daryl, we can turn to the work of a very influential 20th century theologian named Reinhold Niebuhr. Before we jump into Reinhold, I just wanted to make sure that we acknowledge the fact that There are some people who have a lot of anxiety around this. There Mm -hmm. are some people who don't know how to navigate it. They're overwhelmed. They're like, there's too many rules. There's too many clauses. There's too many things to understand. And some would take the disengaged position where they're like, I don't want to deal with it. I'll just let it happen. And there are others who are so actively involved and and they get overwhelmed. So their fears and anxieties are not unfounded. And the good news is the Bible has a way to acknowledge tensions. And the Lord in his wisdom has given theologians and people who think very carefully about it into Reinhold Niebuhr. And he has a book called Christ and Culture. And he outlines five distinct views on how Christians should relate to culture and authority. And there are certain churches and denominations who have aligned themselves under different stances, and I'd like to just unpack some of those stances. Yeah, there's five of them. We can't spend a lot of time on any of them, but um, the first one is Christ against culture, right? And this is the one that sort of says there's such a fundamental divide between the church, let's say, the Christian community, and the wider world that Basically, the only way to keep yourself pure is to withdraw, to not engage the culture at all, to set yourself apart. So we can think of Mennonite, Amish uh, traditions, Anabaptist groups that literally reject the uh, aspects of modern life, like you know, electricity or cars and, and the like. There's such a divide that they, they take very seriously the call, come out from among them and be yep. ye separate, right? That's sort of the leading verse for Christ against culture. But then, uh, I don't know if it's the opposite, Darrell, but then the next one is Christ of culture. Yeah, Christ of culture says, oh, well, we can actually integrate some of the Christian values with some of the cultural norms that are happening right now. And so they find a common ground within the existing structures and cultures. Uh, You know, you got a lot of main line Protestant denominations that go along with this one, even the Episcopal Church and United Methodist Church that embrace elements of society and social advocacy, for example. They want to promote dialogue with governing authorities, so they found a way. Uh, I don't know if it's a happy medium or not. I do know that they are interested in being involved in society and not running away from it or being away from it. All right. A third model for Niebuhr, Christ above culture, and this one, in my opinion, there's partial truth in all five of these, by the way, Uh, but this really recognizes the transcendence of Christ, his lordship over everything, right? He is superior to any secular authorities that are out there. And so what we need to do in our lives is just align with Christ while we are in the culture, but we answer to a higher power, basically, right? 
Christ is above culture. There's another one in Niebuhr, had Christ and culture in paradox. There are tensions between our spiritual ideals and the realities of the world, but we, we try to navigate those tensions. We, we try to keep those in creative tension, right? We try to uphold biblical principles while also engaging in civic responsibilities. We recognize that they're two very, very different realms, different spheres we're going to talk about later in this program from Abraham Kuyper. So that's that one. And then there's a fifth one, finally. Christ transforming culture, which is an optimistic look on cultural engagement. And there's potential for transformation through Christian influence that can happen in the culture. So we're called to be agents of transformation. We're called to be ambassadors for Christ. And we can actually involve ourselves and allow God to use us as lights in dark areas and dark places. There are different views. These are five of the different views that Niebuhr had. What is the Christian supposed to make out of all of this is that we need a lot of discernment and a lot of scripture to teach us. And Romans actually speaks to how we're supposed to interact with culture. Romans 13, 1 through 7, very interesting passage. We'll just read it a minute and then we'll comment on it. Paul writes to the Christians living in Rome, Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against that authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring down judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. You want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what's right, and you won't be condemned. For the one in authority is God's servant. The, the Greek word there is diakonos, God's servant, God's deacon for your good. But if you do wrong, then be afraid. But then he goes on to say again, the, they are God's servant. They're, therefore, it's necessary to submit to the authorities, um, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. And it's also why you pay taxes for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe them taxes, pay them taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. So very, very interesting words there in Romans 13. And I think they are the more interesting when we remember who are the governing authorities Paul was talking about here. Caesar. Yeah. You know, who had no respect for God, who thought he was God. That makes this even more challenging. Yeah, it does, because it says that the God has established that authority and God is the one to put that authority in place. And God is uh, giving us the way to respond in that situation. It also picks up like that in First Peter chapter two, where it says, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and commend those who do what is right. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect for everyone and love the family of believers and fear God and honor the emperor. And I know we don't have any emperors right now, but I mean, the president, king, prime minister, senator, a governing official can be also inserted there. And again, for both Paul and Peter, uh, given that they were talking about Roman authorities who actively persecuted the church, who were godless, it was almost a cult, uh, a, a pagan cult, the whole Roman government, it's quite remarkable that they still say, honor those people, right? We're not talking about just some popularly elected president or prime minister who is, you know, kind of a nice person. And now we're talking about a, a very, very harsh regime of the Roman Empire. And even so, do what we said in the previous program, the first program in this series from Peter, uh, we were looking at First Peter 3, to be polite, be civil. Be respectful. You need to regard uh, the authorities as uh, ultimately gaining their authority from God. But Scripture has more to say on this. We're going to delve into that, dig into that in a minute, so stay tuned. We're glad you've joined our Groundwork Conversation. If you're enjoying today's discussion and want to download or listen again, you can find the audio podcast and transcript for this episode on our website, groundworkonline.com. Want to dig deeper? You can also find episode guides and blogs available to supplement your study. Curious about another episode or series we've mentioned? Search our episode library to find hundreds of conversations about God's Word and what it means for God's people today. Add your voice to our Groundwork conversation by visiting groundworkonline.com. And thank you. Support from listeners like you makes Groundwork possible. 
I'm Daryl Delaney with Scott Jose, and you're listening to Groundwork. And in this segment, we've been talking about how to dig into the complexities of how to engage the government and society, knowing that as believers, we don't always agree with everything that is happening. And basically, you brought out a very interesting thing in the last segment, Scott, about how Peter and Paul are telling the disciples and every Christian to honor the government, even though Caesar and the emperor are trying to eliminate Christians and Christianity. And it shows the concept that, oh, there are some things that are not perfect about the government. There can be tainted and it can be, uh, you know, because of total depravity, we know everything that humans do is tainted with sin. And so we know that there's a complexity there where we're called to honor God under these structures that he's established, but they have been tainted. Everybody, there's no one righteous, not even one, Paul wrote in Romans chapter 3, all turn away. Um, So we were called, as we just saw in the previous part of this program, we are definitely called to honor the emperor, honor the president, honor the prime minister, honor the governing authorities as God's diakonos, God's servant. But that doesn't mean we're blind, right? So now we're going to nuance that a little bit. So we're going to, we already established that. That should be our baseline. However, there are limits, right? Uh, Acts 5, 29, when, when, when the governing authorities told um, you know the disciples, the apostles, to be quiet, Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than people. That is true. Now, a lot of the time in our lives, Daryl, I think we can honor God and the ruling authorities at the same time. Right. right. Uh, you don't have to agree with every governmental policy to faithfully pay your taxes. Right. You don't have to always like who's ever the president or the prime minister at any given moment, but you can still respect them. But then there are lines. And if you are called to renounce your faith, if you are called upon to, by law, do something you regard as immoral, you have to uh, engage in, and we'll talk about this a little bit later from Martin Luther King Jr., some civil disobedience. But we also want to talk a little bit about, Darrell, about how we regard the government. And maybe we can get a little help there from the Dutch theologian Abraham Kuyper. Yeah, so Abraham Kuyper has this notion called sphere sovereignty, and he talks about how God has established these distinct spheres of authority, and government is one of those spheres. And I think the notion of that comes from Psalm 24, 1, where we read, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it, for he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. The idea that these things weren't originally designed to be tainted and uh, marred by sin, but God had a order to things that he wanted to establish. Government's one of those sectors, if you will, and God will be honored in those places, even though there is some taintedness now. The other thing that I think we really can draw from Abraham Kuyper and his sphere of sovereignty. So, you know, there's lots of different spheres. I can't remember how many, but there is the sphere of the church. The church is its own sphere. There's the governmental sphere and education sphere, right? There, there are lots of different, you know, business sphere. The other thing that Kuyper wants us to remember but that we often forget is that you don't want to treat the government like it's supposed to be the church. You don't expect the government to do the work of the church. And you don't expect the church to do the work of the government, right? Keep those things straight. Keep those things separate. Because if you, uh, Kuiper, you know, would warn, if you if you mess those up, if you confuse your spheres, then you're going to ask something of somebody that isn't really what God is calling them to do. But again, we, we do recognize the church is a separate sphere from the government. But what if the government calls on us to do something bad? What if the government sanctions policies that show favoritism or or that prop up things that stratify people into various uh, realms of worthlessness or worthiness? Then what? I think you brought up a very interesting point is that I think some of the people today are having challenges because they are expecting the government to be their spiritual and moral authority. Mm -hmm. They're expecting the president to be their spiritual and moral authority. When we know that that is not what it is called to do based on this teaching and based on what God has established. And so some people are hurt and frustrated and let down when the character of people breaks down. But God did say that it would, you know, people will let you down in this way because that's not the standard that they're called to in certain spheres. And they've shown favoritism, which is what James 2 talks about. We're not supposed to do. He says, my brothers and sisters, believers of our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes and a poor man in filthy old clothes comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, hey, here's a good seat for you. But you say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? 
And again, what what happens if whole societies sanctioned maybe by the governing authorities? Does this kind of stratifying of people treats the rich a different way than they treat the poor? treat white people different than they treat black people or brown people. Well, then I think we're back to what Peter said in Acts 5.29. Um, we have to obey God rather than people. And so sometimes part of our honoring of the governing authorities is a calling to be their better selves, right? Oh, yeah. uh, and here we can think of Martin Luther King Jr. and the civil rights movement, civil disobedience. That was motivated to call the whole country, to call the government of the country to be a better self uh, and to treat all people with justice and righteousness and fairness. Interestingly, though, Daryl, since in the previous program, we really emphasized what we called Christian civility, what theologian Richard Mao calls Christian civility, to be polite, to be respectful. We saw that in a couple passages in this program as well. Martin Luther King said, we resist, but we do it peacefully. Right. We, we don't become like the people we're resisting because then we've been defeated. So you can resist, you can stand up, you can call the government to a better self, and you do that even in Christ-like ways. It's true. And, uh, you know, Dr. King has been known to say that an unjust law is no law at all. And so, you know, being able to navigate that in a situation that civil disobedience demonstrates that highlights, hey, we're holding you accountable to the standard that you said that you would do. And we also see in Scripture there are places like in Hebrews 11 when it talks about Moses, how he challenged the unjust authority of the Egyptian pharaoh. And we see the Israelites being liberated from slavery there. And we see that even though the governing authorities were Established by God, they also have been tainted by saying we can find hope knowing that God has used uh, these types of movements to abolish slavery and things like that. So God can still do transformative, powerful things in the light of human condition and affairs. That's right. As believers, when we know that we are standing up for deeply biblical principles, things that honor the image of God in every person— Every person, not just the ones we like or who look like us or dress like us, we, we, we see the image of God deep in all people, even though some people will say, well, you're not, you're not respecting the governing authorities when you call on them to ch-. Well, no, we actually are in respectful ways calling for transformation in culture, which is one of the things we looked at earlier from also Reinhold Niebuhr. But as we close out this program in just a minute, um, we're going to uh, look for some actionable insights, we might call them, rooted in Scripture. So stay tuned. What does it mean to be a Christian and a fan of movies, music, television, and video games? I'm Josh Larson, editor of thinkchristian.net and host of the Think Christian podcast. I invite you to join us for faith-filled reflections on pop culture. Visit us at thinkchristian.net or search for the Think Christian podcast, where we'll be talking about what it means to be a follower of Christ, even in the playful moments of our lives. You're listening to Groundwork, where we dig into Scripture to lay the foundation for our lives. I'm Daryl Delaney. And I'm Scott Jose. And Daryl, in this final segment of this second episode in our three-part series on Christians in society, we've been thinking specifically about Christians interacting with governmental authority, but we can think of some practical steps. How do we do this? Uh, What is our posture? Uh, And we have some ideas. So first, I think that we need to understand that God is calling us to have active participation in civic duties. Um, We're called to vote. We're called to engage with representatives. We're called to write the letter to the town hall. We're called to go to the town hall meeting. We're called to advocate for justice because these are tools that influence the society. And a lot of people will kind of disengage thinking, oh, well, I don't think I should vote or I don't think it's going to matter. But I think if we trust the Lord in the process and we do our due diligence, then we can move the needle. Scott. You know, somehow when you were just talking there just now, I was reminded of that, that famous verse in Jeremiah, right, where the people are in captivity, they're in Babylon, right? And you want you talk about people who are tempted to disengage, like, I'm not going to do it. You know, what did Jeremiah say? What did the Lord say through Jeremiah? Pray for the prosperity, prosperity and peace. Pray, yeah, pray for the city, because if it does well, you do too. You do too. Right? You're going to saw off the branch you're, you're sitting on if you just refuse to engage. So, yeah, that that's the first thing I think we can say. Vote participate, dialogue with with people who are in authority. Some Christians are called to actually 
have a role as a governing authority that they feel called to Congress. Oh, yeah, in yeah. This, they feel called to Parliament. Maybe they feel called to run for president or, or mayor or be on a township a supervisor board. That, too, because we view, as we said earlier from Romans 13, because we view the governing authorities as God's deacon, as God's servant, certainly when Christian people themselves are in positions of power, they can serve God in that way. Recognizing that the government isn't the church, right? right. you got to keep that right. Kyperian severe sovereignty stuff straight, but you can certainly participate. Uh, The second thing, speak truth to power. Um, So Christians are called to be the prophetic voice. We bring words from the Lord to the society that we live in. There's two types of prophecy. One is forth tell, Mm -hmm. F-O-R-T-H. That means that we're talking to the generation in which we are called to live in, in the context, the Zetim Laban, if you will, the context in which we are living. And so we are called to say, hey, listen, this is God's standard. This is how much we've fallen short from it. And we also need to make sure that they don't contradict the biblical principles that we're called to. And we also know that we can voice our concerns with courage. Exactly. You know, when you think about speaking truth to power, I flash back to Mother Teresa of Calcutta, this diminutive nun, just this little, this little, little person, you know, and how she one time, I think, came to the United States Congress, gave a, an address to the Joint Session of Congress, and just boldly called on people to be pro-life, you know, to protect innocent life. So there's, here's this little, little lady, <laughs> a little nun uh, from Calcutta, India, speaking truth to power, right, and being courageous uh, in in doing it. And, and we are all called to do that. Uh, it's sort of like, you know, even though uh, Israel was a different kind of society than any society anybody lives in now, you know, Nathan the prophet coming to King David to just confront him about that bad business with Bathsheba and Uriah, a dangerous thing to do, yeah. right? Uh, it's dangerous to speak truth to power, but it is something we're called to do. Additionally, Paul, he speaks to Caesar in Acts 25. He's like, wait a minute, I'm a Roman citizen. Mm -hmm. I have rights here. So I'm going to use the legal system to actually address these things and ensure fair treatment and and get make sure injustice is held accountable. I think also thoroughly, too, we must use discernment and prayerful engagement because we don't always know what we should do, Scott. Mm -hmm. I just want to be honest. I don't always know how who I should vote for. I don't know how I should understand this policy. I don't know if it's going to benefit us, if it's not going to benefit us. And I have to pray through and ask God to help. So, I mean, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says it very clearly. If you trust the Lord with all your heart, don't lean on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him. He'll make your path straight. And so you have to discern. You can't just blindly do everything. You actually need to actually take some time and pray through and say, God, show us the way. And he will. Exactly. Yep. Sometimes things are pretty cut and dried, black and white. Uh, You kind of have a really firm sense of what's right. But a lot of times we're in the muddled middle uh, of various issues and we have to ask God to give us wisdom uh, and discernment. And I think uh, also, Daryl, particularly in this deeply, deeply divided partisan political time, and particularly the United States, uh, I think Christians also need to give each other uh, a break, cut each other some slack. I'm doing my best here, trying to discern who to vote for, trying to discern how to say the right thing. So let's give each other a little bit of a generosity of spirit as we discern these things together. And as we do that, a last thing we'll uh, say for this program, display endurance and hope to a watching world. As we engage with society, as we engage with the government, as we submit to the government, as we encourage the government, even when we have to challenge the government, we do it with endurance and hope, knowing that God's got this thing. The ultimate vision for what's going to happen, the ultimate governance of the world, the ultimate coming of all justice and righteousness is what we see at the end of the Bible, Revelation 21, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death. That's a reminder, Daryl, that even now, uh, with other governing authorities in place, uh, God's got this thing. 
Jesus is on the throne, and that's our ultimate hope, and that is what we need to show to the world. And as we engage with society and government authorities, we can actively participate, speak truth to power, exercise discernment, maintain endurance and hope in God and His sovereignty. And when we embody those Christ-like virtues with wisdom, we show the world who Christ is, and we effectively represent Him. Thanks be to God. Thank you for listening and Digging Deeply into Scripture with Groundwork. We hope you'll join us again next time as we examine biblical wisdom for the relationship between the Christian church and political power and of the all-importance of Christ-likeness. Connect with us now at groundworkonline.com to share what Groundwork means to you and tell us what you'd like to hear discussed next on Groundwork. Groundwork is a listener-supported program produced by Reframe Ministries. Visit reframeministries.org for more information and to find more resources to encourage your faith. We're your host, Daryl Delaney with Scott Jose. Our recording engineer is Dob Morris, and our post-production supervisor is John Reeder. Our senior producer is Courtney Jacob.